we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna to talk about um, one of the biggest themes I think you're hearing in media and advertising and, um, and, and the future of television certainly and marketing. And rather than actually have a, one of those really long panels where we can go back and forth like three times on four questions, um, I thought one of the best things we could do would be to bring two of the most thoughtful and strategic leaders uh, in the uh, in the television and media industry um, to talk about these. And we are going to leave some time for some questions. And so if you have some, you know, be ready and thinking about them in the mics. So I have here to my um, immediate right, Beth Rockwood, Executive Vice President of Research, um, and there's probably more to the title than that, but <laughs> at Discovery Communications. Um, uh, yes, I know you're, yeah, I, I know that. The span is broader in the business, but you know, as someone who's a real, has been a real leader in the industry and at Discovery and across, you know, television and media, um, and pushing forward um, measurements and how we approach it. Um, and Jim Gagan, the CEO and founder of MediaHead, um, uh, a really unique and uh, innovative um, planning agency based here in New York City, and someone who's um, who's also been a real leader in sort of looking forward and uh, helping move the business forward. So the title we're talking about is, are we ready to shift the TV advertising business from media outputs to business outcomes? Um, you can't read the trades and certainly hear any of the CEOs of the, or the major CMOs or, or the CEOs of the major media holding, media agency holding companies and not hear the word. We're focused on business outcomes. So, Beth, what do you think of when you hear that? Well, uh, am I on? Yeah. Okay. Um, I love to hear that because I, I think we really do need to make that shift. Um, and what I was saying to, to Dave and Jim earlier is, you know, I, I started my career out in media planning also. And, um, you know, in, in order for the television companies to really put their best foot forward with, uh, with agencies and clients, we've got to get away from the traditional way of, of doing things and really get back to pointing out the power of the television medium. Um, you know, doing our planning and evaluation on persons 18 to 49 is just, it's not the way to, um, to success. So um, I think it's a shift that needs to happen. I think it's starting to happen slowly. And, you know, I hope we can encourage it to move along a little faster over the next couple of years. So Jim, I, I want to ask, ask you the same question, but if you could frame it with some context and give a little bit more of your background, because it might give a, it gives some, it gives some, uh, give a context to your answer that I think will be important for everybody. Sure, Dave. Um, like Dave said, Jim Gagan. Uh, I run a company called MediaHead, and uh, I am a career advertising executive. Spent my entire life working in in media planning and strategy, and we're in the midst of of redesigning our website, and so that always causes all this deep introspection. You have to rethink why you're doing what you're doing, and so if you go to our website, the one that's up now, well. It'll be replaced. But the point is, is that in thinking through that process, it's like what defines who we are? So what defines this, this company, this business that we're building? And, and I think the key thing for us is a need to understand. And, and when I think about my career, that's always been the case. It's always been how, how does advertising work? How, can we understand the, the, you know, we put things on television, people make decisions. Can we understand the decision process? Can we understand how people choose? Um, and, and, and now it's, I think, you know, and Dave, you're the, you're the first person I talked to um, that was really trying to frame things around, you know, specifically the phrase business outcomes. And, and for us, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's the approach. We work, like I was talking to you before, we work for a couple of, um, we have a couple of private equity funded clients and those private equity guys pay a lot of attention to the money. So they're not willing to give you 10, 15, 20 million dollars to spend on advertising if you can't articulate what the back end is for them. And, and that's become, that's what drives us. So it's, you know, it's research, data, analysis, and, and for us, understanding, you know, the television piece, the digital piece, what's left of the publishing industry, and how it all fits together um, is really important. And 
So give us a little sense of uh, a peek into the conversation with you know, private equity owners of, a, of one of your clients. I mean, without, you don't have to name names, obviously, but like, what kinds of questions are they asking you as a, as, a, as a media professional and strategist? They start off with not believing anything that we tell them. That's where they start. Um, they can't believe that the television industry actually works the way it, well, the way it does, that the buying and selling of television is, is the way it is. They absolutely do not believe any of that. But once you get them past that, then they, they, um, they just, it's really quite simple. I mean, they really want to understand that if we give you this money to spend, what can we get back? And we have to, we have to demonstrate as best we can to them how, um, what the results will be. And so what it's come down to for us is building, um, building statistical models. I hesitate to call them predictive models because some very smart person told me once, once you call it a prediction, it's, it'll be absolutely wrong. So, so we don't build predictive models, but we build these statistical models to try and understand what the input, what the effect of the input is on the output, which of course is, is sales and profitability for these guys. And they just, they're tough, man. <laughs> so, so, Beth, how, how does your organization, let's say from everything from discoveries, sales and account management organization to research, um, how do you think about things and, and you know, when you know, your folks are meeting with someone like Jim talking about we have a client that has budget, an incremental new budget, but we've got to find ways to drive it to outcomes. What kinds of things have you always historically gone to and maybe what kinds of things are you looking to in the future? Sure, Dave. Um, you know, we, we spend a lot of time um, reaching out, meeting directly with agencies and clients. Um, as a matter of fact, that's where I was before I came over today. Um, and, you know, so, so much of what we need to do as a sales organization is to listen and recognize that every client has a different need. And every client is looking for you know, the use of different information, um, some very interested in outcomes, some really not. So while, you know, we like to think of ourselves as, as progressive and, and really want to experiment in a number of things, there are some clients with whom we can, can do that kind of work and others that, you know, just, just really aren't open to it. Um, what have we typically done? I mean, we do, we do a lot of custom research for advertisers, particularly um, if they are trying something new with us that we think has, has real value, um, at that we want to uh, encourage other people to do more of. Um, we do a lot around integrating brands into content since we own all of our content. Um, you know, and we've, we've branded our custom research uh, area the Curiosity Lab because obviously discovery is, is all about curiosity. So we, we really do try to prove where clients are interested that they've attained the outcome that, um, that they need. Um, what I think will happen much more, and, and that tends to be, um, sorry, that tends to be more through survey research and um, other forms of, of research to actually focus on the particular business outcome. So the buys, to date are still very much demo based and you know we, we do bring in a lot of other uh, factors in terms of what we know about our audience and obviously the, the kind of programming that's on our air we know the passion of the people who are watching that um, but we don't tend to use uh, you know other large data sets as much in the in the planning process um, nor do we use them throughout the process through to posting in the way that you know Dave is doing with Simul Media, and I do think that that's the next step. Um, is kind of to to we we won't stop doing the custom research because that's important and it tells us a lot about you know where we're successful and where we need to do better. But I think if we we as we move forward, if we layer on you know the smarter use of data and can can you know answer the kinds of questions that that Jim was talking about, um, that you know as I said when we started, that's really going to help us show the power of the medium. Um, we've done more and more um, kind of examination over the last couple of years, also about 
you know, the indirect effects of television. Um, and where we know TV is powerful on its own, we also have a lot of evidence that it makes all of the other elements of the marketing mix work harder. Um, so that's the kind of thing I think that we need to do moving forward. Um, we've frankly been a little bit lazy in terms of showing the value of television. We just, people have given us that. And I think now we need to show it in, in a, more, uh, a more powerful way. So I think it must be just about two, three, two and a half, three weeks ago, there was a pretty inter interesting um, opinion piece written um, in, the, uh, in the ad trades by a woman, Megan Clarkin, who runs product at Nielsen. And her piece said, um, hi, I run product at Nielsen, and the way TV's measured has to change. And said basically, we're, only a, we're a custodian, we have a partnership with essentially the media owners, and both of us have basically probably sat back, just what you're saying, sat back a little too long not changing it, and we have to put forward a whole new, or a much more holistic framework. Um, I'd like to hear two things. One, Jim, from you, what's your perspective on the idea of, you know, we have a ready Nielsen, and we have, it sounds like a lot of ready media partners. What are the, some of the kinds of things that you think core measurements need to change? Um, and then, and then Beth, would be particularly interested in how you, how you view it as, you know, as a, as a partner of Nielsen and someone who's obviously been very, uh, very influential and, in, you know, it, you know, towards that company as well. So what do you want? You get, if you have a chance, what blank, you know, a blank slate here. What? That, you know, is, this one's tough for me because I'm not a creator of research. I'm a user of, of research. So, so when it comes to creating, um, you know, to creating the data, it's always left up to other people. And, and so I don't think about it all that much. Um, so I'm not really sure what to say. Now you're really happy that you brought me up here, right? Um, no, it's but, perfect. That's, but, that, I think that you actually get to one of the really critical issues, which is, People can argue that they don't like what we have, but actually figuring out what works well and's better and can replace it is hard. I mean, I, I heard, um, uh, I mean, at an event we were involved with, um, Steve Hasker, uh, the global president of Nielsen said, as much as you don't want to hear about demographic data, it is actually, when you describe an audience that way, it's something that everybody can relate to whether you're a market or an agency or a seller. I mean, we can understand man, woman, child, and age, and ethnicity, and so when you only talk in purchase graphics, you may lose a lot that's referenceable. Uh, yeah, actually, that, that's a really interesting point, because we do a lot of, uh, we work with, with firms, do a lot of custom research for, for clients, and we always tell clients to focus on, we want to focus on behavior, and, um, and can we move people from occasional users to more frequent users? Can we identify people who really don't care about the product or are never gonna use it and ignore them and then focus our marketing advertising efforts against the base and this group of swing users or occasional users? And, and we always start off by saying that it's, it, we try to take a behavioral approach and we, we want to ignore the, uh, the demographic stuff, but to make the, everyone comfortable, we always start the presentation with the demographic part. So it's always kind of to exactly your point. It's like we put it up and say, okay, so this is sort of one slide that you get on demographics, and then and we move off that and then move into, into a better, you know, more detailed, specific definition of who these consumers are and how we can move them to yeah, our so, brand. So I want to follow that on, on, a, on a point. A lot of the people here work in very much the cutting edge of TV of tomorrow, the, the people that have pioneered a lot of the addressability and, and companion applications. And that world it demands a certain understanding and specificity around target audiences. Do you think, Jim, that most of your clients have a really good idea of exactly who their customer is? And is it who they think it is? Yeah. Those no, are, not no, necessarily your, no, no. your clients, clients in the marketplace no, generally. It, it, it's, I, can speak, I can speak for my clients. When, 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 when they've been with us for a little while, then they have a much better idea of who their consumers are than when they came to us usually. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes there is a, a significant difference between what they thought and, and, 
And we, we try to take an objective look at the data. One of the principles that we operate by is that there are no preconceived notions. So we don't, we don't start with the hypothesis and then use the data to prove that, that we made the right choice. We start, with, um, we start with, a, with a question that needs to be answered. And in some cases, it's, it's as simple as how do we increase sales? Um, and um, in other cases, it's more complicated. But understanding the question first and then using, using the data, but following the data to its conclusion and then acting on, those re on, acting on what you find is really important. So in some cases, clients have decided who their consumer is. It works for them or has worked for them over a period of time. But then when you get very much more into the data and, again, achieve, uh, pursue it with no preconceived notions of what the outcome is going to be, you end up in a somewhat a very different, sometimes a very different place. So Beth, I'm going to go back to the, the Nielsen question with you. Um, what was your reaction to the piece um, and, and to the whole premise? Well, if I remember right, Dave, it was, um, Megan was talking about measuring total television viewing. And, uh, you know, that sounds so simple. And you say, you know, why are we not doing that? That's what we should be doing. Um, but when you get into it, I'm sure everyone in the audience knows it's not simple. And the technologies that have to be employed and the uh, permissions that have to be granted in order to... Uh, to actually measure a lot of the, the newer forms of, of video are really, really complicated and difficult. Um, so, so, so this would mean, um, just to set the stage a little bit, not only would you be measured at discovery for what's being viewed within the normal Nielsen three-day window or seven-day window, um, but also the streaming video on demand, the video on demand managed by the cable and satellite operators, the streaming that's coming through apps yes. like Netflix or Amazon or other services like that. It could be um, downloads that people have made from, from Apple interviewing it. It could be... Absolutely, Dave. And, I mean, oh, and, and out that, of home. And, and just, <laughs> that would just be for us. Then, yeah. you know, in terms of understanding where viewers are spending time, um, you know, obviously Netflix, Hulu... Um, Amazon are, um, you know, gaining more and more of a, a, a place in, in people's choice of, of viewing options. Um, Nielsen can't help us with that. Um, so for us to really see who is with us and who may be being distracted by other things, we need to know that. Um, and that, that and out of home are just entirely missing. Actually, there's an article in, in Ad Age this morning that, um, that pokes at what Nielsen is measuring and what they're leaving out. Um, and, you know, again, they're working on these things, but they're not there at this point. So we have, we have an incomplete picture. Yeah, I think it was interesting. I think the same week that that came, mm -hmm. the, the opinion piece came out, Nielsen released results from a trial in Chicago where they used technology from their Arbitron acquisition, mm -hmm. which is a passive, which can use passive devices people wear or carry, and they, they measured a nine, seven to nine percent incremental amount of viewership in what people were watching out of home. Right. Bars, restaurants, um, public places, which obviously for a marketplace that can lose, gain or lose billions for a couple points, right. seven to nine points is pretty big. No, there, there are some big holes, um, you know, particular for, particularly for certain groups of people. Um, you know, people who have more devices, uh, more mobile devices, um, household with kids, obviously anybody who's got young kids know um, that they are not just watching on the, on the big screen. There's a lot of tablet viewing going on with kids. Um, you know, our 20-something-year-old our um, group, my kids, um, that, you know, they're, they're viewing in a lot of different ways, and the Nielsen systems really were not set up to capture all of that. So they're playing catch-up. They're doing a good job, but they're playing catch-up right now. So some would argue, and I would say I guess a lot of people in the pure digital world, that doing the leapfrog right now and focusing just on what matters five years out may be more important and a better use of resources, or tying only to business outcomes. Well, I think, you know, as long as we are counting viewers, whether it's demographics or whether it's, you know, 
behavioral. We're still only getting part of the way there because, you know, are they fans of the show? Are they watching because somebody in the room with them wanted to watch? Are they paying attention? You know, we don't, we don't have a measurement of that, really, in terms of our currency measure. Um, we, you know, we can create them, but it's not what we do business based on. We, we basically are doing business based on the headcount. Um, and, you know, when, when we're talking about, you know, changing the way that we look at um, designing and implementing programs, I think there, there's a, a lot of importance in understanding if you have selected the right people to, to target and if you have changed behavior. So we're gonna need to find ways to hopefully use the same currency database to actually show how, that a change has happened or that a change has not happened. And I think there are possibilities of doing that um, with respondent level data, but we don't just necessarily take advantage of that because it's, it's hard and you know, there's a risk involved in showing that something doesn't work, um, but that possibility exists, and I, I think that, that probably, if we really are focused on outcomes, it's gonna be about proving, proving that something worked. So, Jim, one of the things that Beth mentioned was, <clears throat> or offered up, was that maybe the industry hasn't done as good a job as it could in sort of selling and pushing itself forward. And I, I personally think the, for someone who spent all these years in online, that the TV industry has done a pretty awful job of marketing itself yeah. as, a, as an advertising media. So <laughs> um, I'm interested in how your interactions are with your clients when you, know, you, you tell us they're, they're shocked when they learn how television works. Um, I'm wondering, does that say something a little bit about like the age range of the people making decisions at the private equity companies, or is it, certainly people close to the financial community I find tend to be far more digital, you know, device driven. Um, is it hard for you to convince your clients that they should be allocating any money in television in a world of, of at least seeming accountability in online? Sometimes it really is. and and. Um the, the financial guys are interesting because, yes, their, their world is probably much more device-centric from a media perspective, right? Phones or tablets or, you know, laptops, they travel a lot, things like that. So, so I think they probably do watch a lot less TV, and when they do watch television, I'm just talking about the guys I deal with, not, you know, uh, I, I can't say if this is consistent across the entire group, but, but these guys, you know, they travel and they'll watch, like, you know, CNBC when they're on a treadmill or something, and that's TV for them. And, and, um, and trying to get them then to understand that, that A, they are not the consumer or the target audience, really hard. Um, and then um, that people's behavior is different. We were talking about just, I don't know, Nielsen has what, average adult TV viewing on a daily basis of four or something hours or something. Like that. Like four hours and 30 minutes. Yeah, or I could not believe that that minutes. was in fact the case. Just totally disregarded it. Just, no, that can't be the case. Absolutely not. And then you start explaining to them about how other people live their lives. These guys work, you know, 12 hour days. They travel a lot. They don't, you know, but if you're, if you have uh, a nine to five job or a seven to three job, and, you know, it's easy to fit in three, four hours of television or, you know, sports on the weekends to bring that average, average way up. And once you kind of talk them through that, they start to understand. The thing that really blows them away is that there's billions of dollars in, in money that changes hands in the buying and selling of advertising. And, um, and they cannot believe that it happens essentially over the phone. And, you know, no, there's no contract. There's no, like, there's, you know, we're going to buy this and, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. It's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, actually, the bet that I think... It would be interesting, I'd, I'd like you, you to give, maybe you can give us a little flavor for um, the transaction process. Um, I mean, I, 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 was, we, I, was, I was part of an event and we had the head of sales of one of the large network groups. And it was the day after she closed her upfronts. And I mean, this will say who she is, this will sort of give her away, but she, she said, I just did $6.6 .6 billion of business in the last two months or so and I've not signed one piece of paper. 
Not one. And then she said, but unfortunately, as we have some bundles of digital deals that are going to go with those, and we're probably going to be in six months of negotiating over terms and conditions on every single one of them. But I did $6.6 billion, not one piece of paper signed. The private equity guys get apoplectic when you tell them <laughs> stuff like that. They, just, their eyes start twitching. They just can't even believe that it's true. <laughs> Give us a little sense. And why do you think... In, 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 you know, why do you think it works? Because clearly there's an incredible efficiency that seems to revolve around that trust, transaction efficiency. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, I have worked for two television companies in the last 20 years. Uh, I spent 10 years at CBS in the broadcast business and now 10 years at Discovery. Um, and we have a lot of cable networks. You guys know, it's, depending on how you count them, that gets close to 15 in addition to digital products. So very, very different businesses. The broadcast industry basically sell all of their inventory in the, uh, the broadcast upfront marketplace. Um, it's, it's done in a very traditional way. Um, advertisers register budgets. They tell the networks how much they think they want to spend. Um, you know, the networks count the house. They see how much business there is. Then they know what they can do in terms of, uh, of pricing, whether it's going to be a tight market or a soft market. Um, they send back plans uh, to the agencies which in the time that I was at CBS, I think we're still being faxed, <laughs> sadly to say, maybe being sent as a PDF on a computer. Um, the negotiation happens over the phone, um, generally, over a very short period of time, a couple of weeks. Um, after the negotiation is concluded, an agreement is reached over the phone, nothing is signed, and um, off you go. Um, that's, that's the way it works. It's, you know, the business is controlled by a small number of people in terms of the number of broadcast networks, the number of major agency holding companies, and, um, you know, you keep your word. Uh, what, what happens if you don't keep your word? Um, Maybe it doesn't happen. Know, there's not that many examples that I would get. Sometimes, you know, people will run into a business situation where they have to stop advertising, in which case I think the television industry is pretty good about understanding and accepting that and working with people. Um, but, you know, cable, cable is different. Cable is not all done at one time. Maybe half to 60% is done as, at, at the same time the broadcast networks move. Uh, the rest of the business moves throughout the year. So um, it's, it's very much more of a balanced sort of sales approach. And there's more time available to work with advertisers, particularly in the scatter market, um, on more uh, specialized kinds of, of deals with more time involved. But again, the deal is done basically the same way in this terms of an agreement, um, and eventually the paperwork gets signed, but not, not right away. One of the things I heard, which was a, about the way those deals happen, and was a perspective that I found Surprising, but then made sense. So I came out of digital for, I mean, I was almost, you know, more than 20 years ago started in online advertising. And the people that transact with each other frequently, many times I've never met each other and aren't meeting in the transaction. And, and if, if it's a long-term relationship, it may have been a few years. And one of the things someone said to me was, and I said, oh, they, they were talking about whether it's just people give favors in TV and the person said, no, no, you, you don't understand actually we all grew up in the business and you don't even get to the point where you're actually managing significant negotiations until you've got 15, 20 or more years. And at that point, the people you're negotiating with, you know really well. And you've vacationed with probably, you've done other things. And it's not that that gave you favoritism, but what it did give you is trust, which is one of the reasons maybe you don't, I mean. No, that's absolutely right. I think there is, there's a lot of trust. Um, there's a lot, there, you know, there's a lot of competition, but there's a lot of trust. So it's, Which is it's maybe why we, we don't have the same kind of, we don't have a viewability issue in, in TV right. with people selling ads that are right. someplace down and, here and on the floor. And we've had a simpler measurement system. I mean, we have one currency that goes from beginning to end, which is certainly not the case with the digital world. It's yeah. much more complicated. Yeah. Yeah. So if anyone has any questions, we have mics at the front here. I'm going to ask another question, and, but I'm going to keep asking questions if we don't have anyone uh, that, wants to, that wants to jump up. Um, Jim, so 
TV of tomorrow, I mean, it's a, it's a powerful brand, but it's also a powerful concept. How do you even think about that relative to what you do? When you're thinking TV of tomorrow, do you think TV encompasses all things that are televisual in the future, or? It's interesting. We we think about we think about um, we started talking to clients about this a few years ago. Uh, the um, watching TV shows online st st started to become significant, probably three four years ago, um, in some of the data that we use, in some of the um, the resources that we have. And so we started talking to clients about thinking about television not as just television, but thinking about it as video. So don't think about it as you know, TV shows that with something mounted to the wall. Um, and especially if you have, you know, Beth was talking about, you know, kids that are in their 20s. And if you have sort of a younger target audience or, you know, target audience, some of our consumers, some of our clients, they're, they're, their targets sort of run into the young moms kind of segment. So, you know, 35, 40-ish kind of, you know, younger children. And, um, and their world is mobile. And, and mobile over the last, what, year, two years has really become significant. So, so we really, we, you know, we're not buyers, we're, just, we, we're planners. So when we think about it, we think about it as video. We don't care where it's delivered. We don't care how it's delivered. We just, we want to understand how, how we can put a message in, you know, in it. How can we reach the people that we need to reach? So if we can't do it while they're sitting at home, then we'll do it while they're watching TV, waiting to pick their kids up from school or something. We don't care. So how about you, Beth? I mean, do you see, do you think that the brand TV transcends this TV device? Uh, absolutely. Um, it, it has to. <laughs> um, you know, it's about the strength of the content and how engaged people are in the content. Uh, you know, I don't think all video is the same at all, and I don't think the experience of watching on a 50-inch television screen is the same as the experience of watching on, you know, your new iPhone. It's, but we count it all kind of the same way. So that's another thing I think as we move forward, in addition to not just counting people in terms of demographics or buying patterns, is we're really going to have to find a way to understand the, the levels of engagement um, that people have in different kinds of video and, and use that as part of the process. I mean, maybe that's happening on the agency planning side now, but it's not apparent in the, the process of buying. Well, and then, and then it gets to the creative guys. You know, you have to talk to the creative guys about thinking in terms of, um, we use the Miller High Life uh, of video, the online set was a one second, two second video. The guy just stands there and goes, High Life. And, and it was hugely successful, right? And it's running on YouTube and, and in the online space where they're buying video, right? So not only is it under five seconds, which is the non-skippable part, but, but it's just this very specific thing ties directly to the TV advertising because the character is the same and, and some of the iconography that they use is the same. But so we have to have those conversations with the creative guys and not always super receptive. Yeah, and this is, I think, I mean, I think there's uh, two issues here, which, um, <clears throat> One, as the content flows from the, the big television to other devices, we're absolutely seeing a significantly lower ad load, meaning the amount of you know, audience advertising minutes or seconds available. I mean, massively different. Um, and then the question is going to be, can you take creative that was designed or strategies that were designed for 30 second or at the best 15 second um, strategies and make them work in five seconds. How, uh, Beth, how are you all thinking about this? Because you're obviously putting advertising and selling them across a lot of different types of units. Yeah, there's a lot of internal conversation about this, I'm sure, at most, uh, most media companies. Um, there, there's definitely one group of people who think that you, you know, consumers are used to the ad load that they're seeing on linear television, and as we move across platforms, that should be the ad load. And that allows you to add up all the pieces and put them back together and you know, Humpty Dumpty is whole again, <laughs> right. Um, that, but that is a perspective that uh, is there. There are, are other companies that really believe there has to be a different ad load on different platforms and, and the nature of the creative message itself needs to be different on a more personal device. You cannot be as direct. You have to be 
you know, more respectful of the fact that you're popping up on somebody's iPhone. Um, so I think, I think, but that's hard. Then you gotta develop creative for a lot of different small platforms and that's expensive and putting all the numbers back together again is complicated and so you have one kind of simple approach which we know isn't right but unfortunately the probably the correct approach is is really really hard to do well how do you i mean i you know how, how do you think that's going to have to come together i mean obviously with planning and strategy there's a certain amount of well you can't control the buy you influence it significantly but the creative piece how much do you tend to get involved in that more and more it, it's how does it come together is is the question and it's like a little at a time and and over time it's you, 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 the more we work with the more we work with a client and their creative agency the trust issue becomes you know so they'll they'll listen to us they'll take our advice or at least pretend that they're taking our advice but they'll at least listen in the beginning it's like well you know what do you know you're the media guys and you know it has to be this well I don't know. You guys, creative guys get paid a lot more than the media guys get paid. So, I don't know, go figure it out, man. You're making the big money. And it's like, and then they get pissed as, well, I guess maybe they should. But, but, but it, it, just because you don't want it to be that way, it doesn't mean that it's not. So, you, so it needs to be solved. And so we lean into it. So I'm going to uh, end this on uh, one question is, it goes to sort of the core of the issue that we're talking about, which is, you know, are we gonna see, you know, what are some of the implications or what, are we gonna see a world that could shift from a media output focus to a business outcomes? Clearly, the digital display world um, became largely exclusively outcomes focused. And the areas where it, it, it has worked so well were in a lot of direct response categories and things that had otherwise been classified to yellow page directories, um, small business services, lead generation. And, you know, the one challenge there is that if you get a half of 1% return rate, it's like direct mail, you don't really worry so much about the 99.5% that is annoying the hell out of people. Um, TV's always, even in spite of taking a certain amount of direct response and hopefully keeping it in ghettos when possible, um, uh, it has always had a certain degree of control over that creative and, and concern to not to cause tune away. Do you, and for both of you, do you think that as we try get to a more targeted world, we may get towards more direct marketing or lead generation kinds of mentalities that may be less respectful of our audiences on TV? Um, I had not thought that that was a likely direction. I mean, I, I think Do you think that that's what the web is like in a lot of places? Um, yeah, and I mean, I don't, yeah. I don't think, I mean, Television, obviously, that causes people to to change the way they think or to take an action is is a beautiful thing, and it's what we want television to do. And I do think that there are some new te technologies that will allow us to to demonstrate that even more than a direct mail commercial does. But I think one of the things that we struggle with is is how to make the whole hour say, for your 60-minute program, uh, as engaging and pos as possible and, and figuring out ways to actually, almost a la Super Bowl, have people look forward to the commercials instead of having them want to, um, to tune away. And obviously, the quality of the creative is a big part of that. But you know, I th think we need to experiment with different formats on linear, too, longer form, um, things that are more um, themed to the content of the programming and you know I think it would be really a bad thing if we ended up going to uh, more in your face um, direct you know the, the, there's some great direct response uh, commercials but the the ones that are bad are, are very annoying <laughs> Jim yeah I hope that doesn't happen it because it, it's it creates the enjoyability of the experience right I mean I like watching television and um, I, I don't, I guess I hadn't thought about it until right now, but, but I don't think that, that this focus on outcomes has to be, you know, pick up the phone now and go to the website, download a coupon. I don't think it needs to be direct response oriented. We're actually working with a client right now who does believe that it needs to be those things. But, 
but I don't think so. I don't think I don't think it's mutually exclusive. I, I, it, yeah, I would hope it doesn't go that way because that I think would degrade the the the, the experience. Of yeah, I mean, I mean, I bring it up because in the mid '90s. We were all hoping that online and the web page would be that experience of this comfortable, personalized ad that um, is great content and ads you want, not just you tolerate. And it seemed to me, so it is something I wonder and worry about sometimes. Just if you, when you start changing the the, the drivers, but you know, hopefully. Well, I think if we can find ways to show the power of emotionally connected, branded, creative, um, that makes the experience positive by figuring out better measurement, then we should be able to stay away from, from that outcome. Perfect, a great way to end um, this session. Um, thank you, Beth, thank you, Jim. Uh, thank you, audience. Uh, enjoy the rest of your TV of tomorrow. <laughs>